Um, Shad and I are both very appreciative of the fact that all of you are here and not in the bar. If this was an American crowd, you would, I would imagine most of you would be in the bar, but you're not, so we're appreciative. Well, I want to thank the ESC for inviting me to come here and to speak to you to give this plenary talk. Um, my goal is to tell a story, uh, one story, and to give an account, actually, of uh, one account of the origins of the growth of American prison populations dating back to the early 1970s and especially of the extraordinary and troubling racial gap in incarceration that all of us know too well and that has grown only wider in the U.S. in the past 50 years. Um, I'll let you decide whether you believe there are parallels for European societies or whether the profound changes that have taken place in American legal culture and law are simply the result of our unusual politics of crime and of our celebration of procedural rights as primary insurance against injustice. I think here you're more concerned with human rights as well as procedural rights, and it's an interesting tension that hopefully we'll get to at the end. So let me begin in the 1960s. People say, um, if you remember the 1960s, then you really weren't there. That's not true. Um, there's a difference between being drunk and other forms of intoxication, as most of you know. Uh, I was not drunk, I can assure you. Um, the scars from the riots in 47 American cities, in the, at least 47 American cities, in the late 1960s, including several cities with multiple episodes of riots, are visible today in two ways. First, the scars are painfully visible in the physical landscape of a few stubbornly poor cities but even cities that are not so poor. Um, in gentrifying Harlem, not far from my office at Columbia, and also in chronically poor Newark, not far from my former office at Rutgers, um, vacant lots and abandoned buildings and factories are visible, visible physical reminders of the struggles of that era. But the scars also remain visible in a philosophy and jurisprudence of criminal law that has instantiated the disparate fates of racial minorities in the criminal justice system in the US. The riots took place in the midst of profound social and economic restructuring in the nation's cities, but also at the outset of an epidemic of rising crime rates and social disorder that framed both a new political order and a profound transformation of American law and criminal, criminal procedure. Um, within the decade of the 60s, there was an abrupt reversal in the substance and philosophy of criminal law and procedure. By the end of the 1960s, the ceding of rights to criminal defendants and the increasing regulation of police that were characteristic of criminal procedure and constitutional law in the early 1960s gave way through a series of cascading court decisions and new laws to a legal framework that over four decades has expanded the authority of police and curtailed the rights of criminal defendants and supported policies that have sustained a widening racial gap in incarceration. A new body of criminal laws that are facially race neutral have nevertheless had profound racial consequences that have proven durable and sustainable even in the current and sustained low crime area in the United States. The American experience is a cautionary tale for democracies all over the world and of the limits and dangers of using criminal law to manage diversity and social conflict. Um, in the first part of this talk, I want to talk, talk about the antecedents, the context, and the dynamics of this turn in criminal law, focusing on the racial disparities and racial dynamics that exploded in a wave of riots. Next, I want to examine the development of a, the new legal order that took place following those riots, analyzing the reversal in criminal law through a series of court decisions that unfolded over two decades. In part three, I want to examine how the use of race-neutral laws, to, or apparently facially race-neutral laws, to achieve crime control in the absence of complementary models of social regulation, and how these laws have produced disparate racial impacts that have become endogenous to the political and social order in the US. There is a part four, but there's no chance I'm gonna have time to get to it. But part four would be an analysis of the institutional reform challenges to try and undo this and try and restore some sense of racial balance and equality in criminal justice. Uh, the moral of that story would be don't sue, as we tend to do in the U.S. Litigation itself has failed to remedy the inequalities. In fact, there are barriers to litigation that make it very hard to do, and that instead there are forms of democratic regulation that have more promise to um, reintegrate law and justice and reduce disparity. We're not going to get to that, but that would be in the printed version of this paper when it's available, which will be soon. So, first, the 60s. Martin Luther King famously said once that a riot is the language of the unheard. 
However, beyond being simply being, being the language of the unheard, riots are pivotal moments in the history of any society. When a segment of society is motivated or pushed to stand up as one and collectively voice their rage, displeasure, and discontent using violence, it, it places that society at a literal crossroads. This awkward and precarious situation is perhaps most difficult for the police and for government whose job it is to protect and represent both the disaffected group and the larger population that they're part of. How did the American riots of the 60s come about? Well, without question, they'd riot, the 60s saw an increase in violent crime in the US, apart from riots, and the impact of violent crime were skewed towards poor minority communities. In survey after survey in that era, non-whites said that they were much more fearful of crime and much more apprehensive than were whites. And they had reason to be. Rates of serious crimes in cities were nearly three times higher than in the surrounding suburbs, and many times higher than in the rural areas. Most of the victims of crimes were other city residents, meaning that non-whites are far more likely, in some instances nearly 80% more likely, to be victims of crime. Increasing violent crime was a fact that most Americans were aware of, but ghetto residents were the ones who were most likely to confront it. At the same time, relationships between police and ghetto communities were, to put it mildly, strained. The extent of the tension varied city by city. A survey in New York found that 35%, roughly about one in three black men, thought there was police brutality. But in Detroit, 85% of the residents, including 85% of the males, believed that such brutality existed. The complaints ranged from verbal harassment to excessive or unnecessary use of force. Residents complained that police routinely broke up social gathering in the streets, foreshadowing today's emphasis on order maintenance. The police taunted interracial couples, and they were quick to arrest persons who were thought to be out of place. A conservative estimate was that 329 riots broke out in 257 different U.S. cities between 1964 and 1968. That's a lot of riots. Even cities where police believe they had good relationship with, get, with, the, with the black community were susceptible to riots, suggesting that either, either they were in a state of denial or there was some insensitivity that was basic to police culture at that time. What caused a riot to spread from one city to the next was difficult to determine. Riots began in a handful of cities, including New York, in 1964 and 1965. 1966 brought more small, small riots um, in Chicago, uh, various cities in Ohio, San Francisco, Atlanta, and Omaha in the Midwest. The following year began the peak of the civil disorders and the most violent of them, the largest of which occurred in Detroit. Detroit's riot was known as the 12th Street Riot, named for the area where they broke out. And it was the worst one of all, resulting in 43 deaths. 1968 brought the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, which spurred over 100 more riots in cities that had both experienced, that had previously experienced riots, and in cities that had been up to that moment in time calm. Both the federal government officials and researchers, academic community leaders, were at a loss to explain what caused the riots to spread so virally from one city to the next. The riots that got the most attention were the ones that were the worst, not necessarily the typical ones. Police conduct in most riots was less egregious than it was in Newark or Detroit, places where the, where the uh, National Guard was called out. The majority of riots, at least in 1967, caused no deaths and created damages less than $100,000 in currency of that, of, that, of that value at that time. In the 1967 riots, the primary targets of violence were private retail businesses that were looted and burned. Of the civilians injured, both large and, in the large and small riots, the majority were African Americans. Whites lost businesses in some instances, um, but, um, but other than police officers, whites were almost never injured and never lost their lives. Um, the riots thus spread fear just as efficiently as they did any actual harm. The typical riot had no articulated demands, and though rioters expressed generalized grievances, no recognized spokesperson ever emerged on behalf of the rioters, either nationally or in any of the particular places. In some instances, community representatives or even local or national celebrities tried to broker peace agreements, but nothing worked. Ultimately, the police in many cities militarized the conflict by calling in the National Guard, which for uh, you folks here is a reserve citizen army, and that army, citizen army was used to restore security. For each, why did the riots happen? There was a series of triggering events, and the triggering events themselves are very, very telling. Um, there are many different ones. Most began with an altercation between police and residents of the black neighborhoods. In Jacksonville, Florida, violence broke out when police arrested civil rights demonstrators. In Harlem, violence broke out when police arrest, I'm sorry, in Harlem, violence broke out when a white policeman shot a black youth. 
Triggering events were often actions that had happened several times before, but a particular instance was the tipping point, was a tipping point event that came to symbolize community frustrations. Uh, Watts was fairly typical, the Watts riot in Los Angeles. In 1965, the spark for the Watts riot um, illustrates the triggering mechanism. A young man named Marquette Fry, 21-year-old African-American male, was pulled over for running a red light. Mr. Fry had been drinking, and he couldn't produce a driver's license on demand from the police officer. It was a hot night, many people were outside, and they witnessed the event, including eventually Mr. Fry's mother. An altercation began between Mr. Fry, his mother, and the police, and that ended up with Mr. Fry, his brother, and his mother all taken into custody and placed under arrest. The crowd became rowdier when the Los Angeles police arrived, and more general violence in the Watts ghetto broke out and spread very quickly, again virally, as the crowd stoned passing automobiles, assaulted white motorists, and threatened a police command post. The Watts, the Watts riot resulted in 4,000 arrests, more than 1,000 injuries, 600 buildings damages, damaged, and 34 deaths. During the riots, um, those of you who know American baseball, the incomparable pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers, Sandy Koufax, pitched a no-hitter no that night um, in one of the nights of the riots. And he pitched it before a nearly empty stadium at Dodger Stadium because nobody would, go, would, would, would dare traverse the neighborhoods where the riots took place. And I know this because my wife had tickets for the game and she was ordered to stay home by her family. She could not go. Um, one of the first of many commissions convened to analyze the riots was formed in California to study Watts. Governor Pat Brown appointed a commission of six whites and two African Americans to prepare an objective and dispassionate study. Brown eventually lost his office to conservative Ronald Reagan, who campaigned on a theme of law and order, following the, Roth the Watts riots, and also following demonstrations at UC campuses that were part of the free speech movement and also protests against the Vietnam War. All six white members of the commission were members of a political elite, and the two black members were neither radical nor influential in their community. The commission interviewed 79 witnesses and questioned about 10,000 people about the events. On December 2nd, 1965, three months after it began its work, the commission produced its report titled Violence in the City, The End or a Beginning. It was a short report, only about 88 pages, and the description of the riot itself only took up about 15 pages in the report. Violence in the City was also known as the McCone Commission Report, and it's presented what was, became to be known around Southern California and then eventually in Washington as the riffraff theory of the Los Angeles riots. Now, riffraff is not a loaded term in the U.S. It's often used somewhat ironically, but it's also used quite disparagingly quite often. The commission concluded that, first, less than 3% of the ghetto population participated in the riots. The rioters were riffraff, meaning unemployed young criminals and outsiders, and that the majority of the black population opposed the riots. Um, the theory was comforting to whites because it suggested that they did not bear any responsibility for the violence um, or the losses of property or the loss of life. Rather, the report focused on the social, economic, and psychological conditions in the ghettos, along with the lack of public transportation and the depressed status of blacks and Mexican Americans in the area. Despite its social conscience, the report was important for those who wanted to lay blame in the ghettos. Future governor and future President Reagan referred to the rioters as lawbreakers and mad dogs. The Los Angeles police chief insisted that the riots were the work of a gang of Negro hoodlums. Um, chief Parker of the Los Angeles County Police Department also described the rioters as monkeys in a zoo. Mayor Yorty insisted that a small portion of the ghetto community had instigated the riots and had expertise in such areas as making Molotov cocktails, um, a fact that was ultimately rejected by the commission. Um, name calling was not uncommon. Decades later in the 1992 Rodney King riots, um, it became known through the, the um, uh, I forgot the name of the commission, but um, Warren Christopher chaired the commission, who was a, uh, a, a famous political person in the U.S. Um, they reported that the Los Angeles Police Department used the term NHI when issuing a radio call to a police officer to respond to a home where they thought that there were only black residents or in black sections of the city. NHI stood for no humans involved. So in the 60s, the views of leaders like Governor Reagan, Mayor Yorty, and Chief Parker created a lot of pressure to increase policing in the minority community. The McComb Commission, despite its generally liberal and socially conscious analysis, presented an important and useful theory of racial violence that was used by conservatives to mobilize law. 
The national reaction, I think as many of you know, was quite different. The Kerner Commission, as it was named after its um, chairman, uh, uh, former Governor Otto Kerner of Illinois, delivered a report starkly in contrast to the McCone Commission. The long, hot summer of 1967 created a political space in which to challenge the riffraff theory, and that theory with the theory that had been advanced by McCone. The Kerner Commission was unequivocal in famously concluding, our nation is moving towards two societies, one black and one white, separate and unequal. The Kerner report, so, report saw the violence as criminal, but as a, not as criminal, but as a response to oppression and something that could only be cured by a fundamental change in the actions of white America. Then President Johnson recognized the political costs of the riots, and they were profound, and he claimed that each riot cost me 90,000 votes. Like now, the political world was dominated by television sound bites, reducing complex questions and sensationalizing the events. In 1967, riots had become the first issue of concern identified in public opinion polls, more so than the costly war in Vietnam. And Americans worried aloud about their personal safety, even though the risks were not nearly, were not evenly distributed among the population. Liberals were caught in a, caught in a bind, avoiding placing blame on black agitators or black muggers, meeting statistics with disbelief, but generally unable to make their case to the public. The Democratic candidate for president in 1968, uh, Vice President Hubert Humphrey, reflected this dilemma, and he was ineffectual against the decisive law and order campaign that was the margin of Richard Nixon's narrow presidential election in 1968. Running on a promise to restore, restore law and order to the silent majority, silent majority. Nixon juxtaposed the term crime with his notion of the silently suffering classes of law abiders and therefore thereby externalizing the issue and connecting it to the dangerous classes in specific places and to an underclass, i.e. black, which was not part of us. Nixon was the first to characterize criminals as enemies of the state, a rhetorical flourish that, is, that had a lot of political salience then and still has a lot of political salience today. Then comes the turn in criminal law, which followed very closely on the heels of these events. Um, the turn in law followed the riots and was more than a decade in the making, um, but was no less racialized than were the riots themselves. The 60s was an era of racial conflict on many fronts, and to many, crime was part of a spectrum of challenges, not just to public security, but to social order and to the primacy of social and political institutions that regulated the poor. Compounding the political tensions were provocative social and economic policies, Johnson's Great Society, that signaled an expansion of government that itself was historically a red flag for nativists and for other conservatives. In many areas of law and social policy, reformers and advocates pushed for either the enforcement of procedural rights or the transformation of constitutional rights into substantive rights. There were human rights. These were human rights in the sense that I think Europeans speak of them. Uh, but that are rarely discussed in those terms in the U.S., and they certainly are not articulated as such in the U.S. In areas of housing, health care, welfare, education, mental health, child welfare, rights-based arguments monopolized civil litigation, and courts were compelled to enforce procedural rights in a way that substantially empowered the poor and, 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 and the formerly disenfranchised, often for the first time. Gains were made, but also expectations were raised. Predictably, the pushback was fierce, coming mainly from working and middle class whites. Resistance was often violent, especially when housing laws, restrictive covenants for example, were overturned and led to the dismantling of residential segregation. Vigilanteism was not uncommon against black families who were integrating white neighborhoods. Um, Anti-war activism and cultural challenges to authority, not to mention broad changes in drug use and sexual behavior, fueled a deeply, de a very deep conservative resentment and a simmering rage. Regulation by the police was a key battleground, um, both in this litigation and in this, this struggle over time, but also regulation of the police was fundamental in the struggles in, in, around the riots. Struggles over civilian regulation of the police, given the scarring riots of the mid-decade, were as fierce as struggles were over housing desegregation and school integration. <clears throat> For example, in New York City, efforts by progressive Mayor John Lindsay to create a civilian complaint review board turned into somehow a national referendum on the question of whether and how police would become accountable democratically to citizens for their actions. Organizations and interest groups from across the country poured money into the campaign, 
placing full-page advertisements in the local newspapers urging defeat of the initiative, which it was. One reason for opposing civilian control and taking a stand, apart from the racial divide that was aggravated by the debate, was the, tra was the trajectory of U.S. Supreme Court decisions earlier in that decade. Rulings earlier in the decade curtail police discretion in stopping and searching suspects, mandating that suspects be given the right to an attorney before in interrogation, mandating legal representation of both misdemeanors and trials for major crimes, and a series of other trial rights, and also litigation that stopped police from the casual and discriminatory enforcement of loitering and other social order offenses. The totality of these rulings produced a fundamental shift in rights from police to criminal suspects. In a world where rights were seen as finite, the losers in this exchange were, were portrayed as the victims of crime, who, in a time of riots and rising crime rates, were portrayed in political discourse as Nixon's silent majority, working class and middle class whites. Conservatives more directly portrayed the police as under attack. And right in that era was the first time you would see a support your, local support your local police bumper sticker appearing on a variety of cars. And in the midst of all of this legal change were the three hard facts of riots, of both a heroin and a violence epidemic plaguing cities. Um, and in particular, in 1967, a sharp rise and nearly a threefold increase in the next five years in the rates of homicide and other violent crimes. So it's not surprising that at that moment came the turning point. This is the turning point in law. The turning point was in 1968, in a case known as Terry versus Ohio. Terry versus Ohio was an uninteresting case in many ways, were it not for a few contextual facts. First was the timing. The case itself arose in 1967, was decided in 1968, and it was an event that took place not long after one of the nation's most violent riots in the city of Cleveland had subsided. Second was the location, not just because it was Cleveland, but because it was Ohio, because that decision earlier in the 1960s, which was known as MAP versus Ohio, which curtailed the police right or, or curtailed the police practice of stopping people on uh, suspicionless stops and searches, took place in Ohio. Um, and that was a place that was seen as a battleground on these questions of rights. MAP was a ruling that was overturned by the, na that this was the ruling overturned by the nation's high court in Terry. Third was the timing of the Supreme Court ruling. This took place in June 2008, two months after the assassination of Martin Luther King, just a few weeks after the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, and at the tail end of what was to be the last wave of riots for that decade. Terry was also notable because of its racial dynamics. Race was ignored as a subtext of Terry for many years. Criminal, criminal procedure scholars would read Terry and talk about its meaning and ignore the question of race. Um, until a few legal scholars, two being Jack Chin, University of Arizona, and Tony Thompson at NYU, published work that began to peel away the layers of racial coding in the text of the Terry opinion. Suspect Terry was spotted by Officer McFadden walking back and forth near a jewelry store at closing time. This was the basis for the officer's suspicion. The court said he, uh, McFadden thought he was casing the place. Casing meaning scoping it out as a possible burglary opportunity. The court said that society depended on the discretion and the professional judgment of the police to detect situations where, where, and this is their language, crime is afoot. The court ruled that Officer McFadden had ex exercised his lawful discretion in assuming reasonable suspicion that suspect Terry was about to commit a crime. This was the professional judgment of Officer McFadden, and the court implored um, both the public and also other courts to defer to the professional judgment of, of people like McFadden. But what was the basis of McFadden's judgment? McFadden was white, Terry was black. McFadden, up until recently, had patrolled inner city neighborhoods, primarily black neighborhoods in Cleveland, for 20 years before moving to his, assign his assignment in a more commercial part of the city where race is mixed regularly. His notions of crime were sharply tuned to the contingencies of crime in those residential areas, and uh, the residential areas where he saw most ex almost exclusively black residents, and he exported those perceptual frames, or cognitive biases, to use the contemporary language, to his new posting. So to what extent was McFadden's suspect suspicion due to Terry's race, or was it due to a set of racialized codes based on his experience with crime that he had internalized over many years? Was McFadden's Terry's race a signal of crime, race itself a signal of crime, uh, based on the base rates of the world that McFadden had just left? Would McFadden have assumed that crime was afoot if Terry were, were white, 
and the rhythms and patterns of white life form the perceptual frame of Terry's actions. The Terry opinion ceded to police the right to apply and to make decisions based on subjective assessments that behavior is suspicious. The court demanded articulable indicia of suspicion, meaning the officer had to be able to verbalize exactly which behaviors were suspicious. But the ruling also instantiated a notion of, this, of suspicion that was predicated on assumptions by officers built over long periods of immersion in a police and popular culture that had reinforced the links of race and crime and giving police the authority to act on that suspicion. In other words, it's interpretation of, indi of indicia or behavioral indicia. But the language in Terry stripped away race. Race is hardly even mentioned in the text of the opinion. In fact, it's not mentioned at all other than the descriptions of the two actors. The fact that the event and the opinion were issued in a period of racial and social conflict and turmoil, where rioting citizens were termed enemies of the state, was a contextual amplifier of the urgency of the decision. Years later, scholars, legal scholars and historians viewed Terry not just as a point of reversal of the shift in procedural and substantive rights to criminal defendants, but as a give back to the police of the discretion that they had lost in the past decades criminal procedure rulings. The court spoke of the needs of law enforcement for discretion to act aggressive, aggressively to reasonably confront crime. And they placed citizen safety as one of the consequences of the ruling that would move in any other direction. But reasonableness in this case was a construct built into the context of the moment. And, the, in the, and in the institutional crisis that was brought about by the racial threats of riots and of a rising crime rate. Though race was nowhere in the language of Terry, the meaning, the term through terms such as reasonable suspicion, crime as a foot, other coded language, and the context, the, the, the racial dynamics between Terry and McFadden, the place and era in which the event took place, the war metaphors invoked both by the court and by in popular culture to fight crime, and the historical arc of cases meant that race was everywhere in the Terry opinion. The rights of defendants reversed quite abruptly, and in fact, on a dime, as we say in the US. What followed in the ensuing decades was a series of court decisions and opinions that advanced, both advanced the Terry seating of procedural rights to the police and other legal actors, and that also created barriers to, to legal barriers to obtaining substantive affirmative rights or relief from what was seen as constitutional violations of rights. Very few, if any, court opinions went the other way. Let me give a couple of examples. 1972 case rejected the right to sue for racial discrimination, absent evidence that discrimination was individualized and intentional. Disparate impact, disparate impact, the fact that a policy would produce disadvantage for one race relative to the other, was not enough to warrant legal intervention. This had broad effects, not just in criminal law, but in other contested areas of substantive rights, and most particularly in housing and employment discrimination. Another case permitted summary evictions from public housing unless the tenant could show individualized racial discrimination, which is a very hard task given the racial composition of most public housing projects in the US, which were overwhelmingly non-white. In 1984, 1985, the Supreme Court ruled the same way in capital punishment. Discrimination against minorities was a fact the court found, a statistical fact, but a pattern of discrimination was not a constitutional violent violation unless it was individual and intentional. A racial profiling case in 1973 ruled that police could stop vehicles based solely on the ethnicity of the race and driver or passengers if there was a reason to suspect that the group was at risk of criminal activity. A series of rulings through the 1980s expanded police authority to pro use profiles to identify drug couriers in airports and the highways, where race was an amplifier of other more innocuous cues of suspicion. This led to a broad expansion of highway stops shaped by, the DE by DEA training and uh, through its own materials. I'll skip Brown v. Oneonta. Brown v. Oneonta was a case, though, very quickly, where the police were searching for a black rape suspect. They had a suspect description. They stopped 300, a, a person who was between 13 and 25. They stopped 300 people between the ages of 13 and 65, including three women. A ruling called Wren in 1996 allowed the police to stop citizens on the basis of race, so long as one other indicator of suspicion was present. Um, and that requirement didn't include anything race neutral. Uh, it didn't have to be a certain indicator of suspicion that was uncorrelated with race. And it led to the absurd ruling that somehow uh, dreadlocks plus, plus race could form suspicion and be the basis for police action. Um, 
a doctrine called the high crime area emerged from cases beginning in 1972 through Illinois v. Wardlow in 2002 that said that individuals in high crime areas have different and fewer rights against search and seizure than they would in other locations in the same city, state, or town. In other words, the court substituted place for race as a signal of reasonable suspicion, the Terry language, and a justification to stop and search an individual. The court offered no guidelines to decide what was the threshold of a high crime area. That too is left to the judgment and subject subjective evaluation of the police. So today, in the context of Fourth Amendment police citizen stops or interactions, or what's known in police jargon as Terry stops, high crime areas are now legal and constitutional realities that further expand the rights of police to conduct searches even when they fail to meet only thin criteria of reasonableness. Criteria such as furtive movements or the bulge, the existence of a bulge in somebody's pocket. My wallet could be considered sticking out of my pocket like this to be reasonable suspicion for a stop, depending on the neighborhood that I'm in. If you read police reports, the term high crime area is almost a talisman now, often quoted and almost always the tipping point in legitimating police actions and the conduct for stopping an individual. The conclusion in legal opinions among scholars and on the street is the same way, is, is all the same. A high crime area designation almost always shifts the analytical balance in the courts toward a finding of reasonable suspicion. Um, at the same time, the courts erected very high barriers to seeking relief. Uh, two cases in the 1990s foreclosed appeals for racially selective prosecutions. Claims that the blacks were the, claims that the bla blacks were the subjects of prosecutions for drug crimes or for other offenses left, were left unheard because of that demand. Um, the court again demanded that evidence be specific and individualized targeting of an individual because of race. And it turns out that this is nearly an impossible hurdle to get over. By 2005, the court's business in this area was done, or nearly done. The court concluded in a case called Hudson v. Michigan that there actually, and this is Justice Scalia speaking, that there really may no longer be a need for the courts to even regulate police stops and searches because the typical police force now in American cities was both highly trained and professional on the one hand and racially diverse. So we were okay. We were, we were good. Most constitutional errors or violations are dismissed now if police intentions are good or if the errors were, and, and concluding that the errors themselves were either innocent or harmless. Yet recent studies show that anywhere from 15 to 45 percent of police stops or seizures are constitutionally invalid. Some of that research is mine. We've done under the sponsorship of the Attorney General of the State of New York a few years ago. And the same pattern sustains today. Most of these stops don't result in arrests. Of the more than 500,000 stops each year by police in my city, in New York, fewer than 10 percent result either in arrest or in citation. So most of these police citizen interactions avoid sunlight because so few result in arrest, and the courts are simply unaware of them. The police obviously are well-trained, savvy consumers of the law. Professor William Stuntz describes the current character of criminal law and criminal procedure in the US as a pathological mix of politics, crime, race, and law. His analysis complements, through a more formal legal lens, the analyses of David Garland and John Simon on the evolution of criminal law and legal cultures that have contributed to the growth in prison populations and the racially disparate impact, incar impact incarceration, incarceration impacts that we see today. Stunts' analysis complements Michael Tonry's analysis on the, specific, the consequences of the specific path of drug laws that have, that have contributed so heavily to today's large racial disparities in incarceration po populations. But the volume and the makeup of the prison population in no, results in no small part from structured sentencing laws that disproportionately affect non-whites. Collateral policies, including actuarial models that Simon describes, have deadened, for example, the practice of parole and contribute very heavily to these disparities. The policies endure now today, even as we enter a second decade of sustained crime declines in American cities. And Americans still have a hard time coming to grips over the question of race. In a case called Kimbrough, where the, where the Supreme Court threw out the crack cocaine sentencing disparity, which I think everybody understands, the word race is mentioned twice in the opinion, once in a footnote and once in the very last paragraph of the opinion. It just simply is hard for us to get the words out of our mouth. The cautionary tale here is the political and social origins would have been as what, of what has been a fundamental restructuring of criminal law and procedure that has helped to create a supply of cases that end in incarceration. Animated by social upheavals, racial conflict, a crisis of violence, and the threat to the primacy of legal institutions, 
Fundamental changes in political and legal culture have become part of the enduring landscape of, political, of, of criminal law and criminal procedure in the US. One lesson is the cautionary tale in the elasticity of procedural rights. We celebrate these procedural due process rights in the US and assume that justice flows from them. Though central to the polity of a diverse society, they nevertheless obviously are mutable, if not even subjective. No society can assume that procedural rights alone will produce either a just or fair or socially productive set of outcomes in the absence of enduring legal and human principles that transcend momentary crises. Thank you. <laughs>